All right, so now we're going to begin our lectures on the cardiovascular system for step one. So this lecture is going to deal with the structure and the histology of the heart. So the first thing we're going to look at are the layers of the heart wall. So right here is the ventricle. We're going to amplify this and take a look at specifically what layers of cells uh, comprise the ventricle. So the first thing is the endocardium. This is a single sheet of cells that lines the ventricle. So this is the layer that's in contact with all the blood inside that chamber. This is the innermost layer. Um, right here is the myocardium. This is all the muscle that composes the heart. This is the biggest layer. This is what generates the pumping force of the heart. In between the endocardium and the myocardium, you have the subendocardium. The subendocardium is important because this is what contains the conducting fibers of the heart. So the fibers that travel from the SA node to the AV node travel through the subendocardium and send branches out that stimulate the um, the myocardium. Um, at the very outside we have the pericardium or the epicardium. Uh, the pericardium is one sac. It looks like it's divided but it's not. It just happens to be fluid between the visceral part of the pericardium, the part in contact with the heart, and the parietal pericardium which is the outermost surface. Now in terms of physiology, this doesn't play very any big role in normal physiology, but this plays a very big role in pathology. So the pericardium can cause many problems for the heart when things go wrong, and we'll talk about this later. Um, now I'm going to talk about the structure of the valve. So you have the tricuspid and mitral valve. These are also known as the AV valves, and then you have the pulmonary and aortic valves. The first thing to note is that the valve composition is very different between the pulmonary and aortic valves and the tricuspid and mitral valves. The AV valves are leaflets, whereas these are very fibrous caps. They're much stronger. Um, the thing with the leaflets is that they require chordae tendinae and papillary muscles in order to close. Now this is very clinically important because the papillary muscles contract and they cause closing of the valve. Now if you have a myocardial infarction in the region where the papillary muscles are, you can damage these muscles and this valve can no longer contract or it can no longer close. So as a result, blood will flow through this valve when the left ventricle contracts. This is called a regurgitation. So a myocardial infarction can damage the papillary muscles which will not allow these valves to close effectively and in turn cause a regurgitation. Um, and this can lead to heart failure and it's one of the more detrimental consequences of a myocardial infarction. Um, this is just showing the blood flow of the heart. Um, basically blood flows from the vena cava or the coronary sinus which carries blood from the coronary veins to the right atrium to the right ventricle which goes through the pulmonary vasculature back into the left atrium uh, through the left uh, ventricle and then moves through the systemic arteries. I think that's a very self-explanatory picture. Um, so now I'm going to talk about the blood supply of the heart. So the left coronary artery and the right coronary artery are absolutely the most important arteries in the heart. The left coronary artery gives rise to the left anterior descending artery, also known as the interventricular artery. This is the artery that's known as the widow maker. As you can see, it supplies a huge portion of the left ventricle and it supplies an interventricular septum. That's not seen in this picture, but that would be going down right here, dividing the left ventricle and the right ventricle. If you occlude this artery, I mean, it has a very high chance of mortality. That's why it's called the widow maker. Um, the left coronary artery also gives rise to the left circumflex artery. Now you have the right coronary artery right here, which gives rise to the posterior descending artery, which kind of loops around the back of the heart and travels down. This supplies the posterior portion of the interventricular septum. Now the two most important things to know on this that can be tested on step one are that the left anterior descending artery has horrible effects when you occlude it. That's why it's called the widow maker. It damages a huge portion of the heart and the posterior descending artery 20% of the time arises from the left circumflex artery. So here's how this kind of question can be tested on. They tell you that the left circumflex artery is occluded and that the posterior interventriculum is damaged. How can this be if it arises from the right coronary artery? Well the answer is in one out of five patients or people the left circumflex artery actually generates the posterior descending artery. So this is a very high yield concept. 
Now I'm going to go into the histology of the myocardium. So I'm talking about the cells that compromise this layer or comprise this layer of the heart. Um, so first thing to note is that sarcomeres form myofibrils and myocardial cells and myocytes contain multiple myofibrils. So what that means is right here in this picture you can see that this right here is a sarcomere. One of these individual layers right here is a sarcomere. This entire collective uh, group of sarcomeres forms a myofibril and then many myofibrils will form one cardiac muscle cell. So some things to note about this besides the sarcomeres form myofibrils which collectively are in cardiac muscle cells is that the cell membrane of the cardiac muscle cell is called the sarcolemma. So this right here, the lining of the myocyte is the sarcolemma. Now the sarcolemma has invaginations in it called T-tubules, which I'll show in the next picture. But you can see it best right here. This T-tubule is directly coming from the sarcolemma, but it kind of cuts inside the cell. And the reason it does this is that if it cuts inside the cell, it can form connections with all these myofibrils and all these um, sarcomeres and sarcoplasmic reticulums much easily. You can't imagine there just being one sarcolemma lining the cell and it having very good communication with the myofibrils within right here. That's why you need to have T-tubules that evaginate from the sarcolemma. Um, another thing to note is that cardiac muscle cells, the myocytes, the big part right here is connected to other myocytes by intercalated discs. Um, these are important because they contain gap junctions as seen right here. These gap junctions allow communications between both cells. This is important because the heart works by, generation, by generating electrical activity between cells and communicating between transportation of ions. We'll see this more in the next lecture when we talk about electrophysiology of the heart. Um, this better illustrates the T-tubule. So this right here is a T-tubule. The T-tubule uh, causes calcium to be released into the cytoplasm of the myocyte. Okay, so this is still considered outside of the cell. It's an invagination of the cell membrane. And the reason it invaginates is it forms a better connection with the sarcoplasmic reticulum. If you didn't have the T-tubule and you just had a straight line going right here, as you can imagine, you're not going to be able to get as much calcium into the myocyte as you could if you had an invagination. Now you can get calcium coming out from all the different um, directions. Um, the sarcoplasmic reticulum is the part of the myocyte that releases the calcium. And then right here you have your sarcomeres, your sarcomeres and your myofibrils. And that's it for this lecture. Next lecture we'll talk about the electrophysiology of the heart.